مثلهم كمثل الذي استوقد نارا فلما أضاءت ما حوله ذهب الله بنورهم وتركهم في ظلمات لا صم بكم عمي فهم لا يرجعون أو كصيب من السماء فيه ظلمات ورعد وبرق يجعلون أصابعهم في آذانهم من الصواعق حذرا والله محيط بالكافرين يكاد البرق يخطف أبصارهم كلما ولو شاء الله لذهب بسمعهم وأبصارهم إن الله على كل شيء قدير صدق الله العظيم صلوات Thank you again for all coming today, uh, being here with us physically, uh, those who are with us virtually online, thank you as well. Today is our eighth lecture and it's titled Evolution of Religion Through Revelation. We're lucky enough to have Sheikh Arif with us again. Can we welcome him with a loud Nara Salawat? and we'll have an extended Q&A as well.
اللهم الله من قرأ الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستقيم إهدنا الصراط المستقيم إهدنا أقبل علينا خير ما قطوي علينا وأمانتي أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام يوم الدين ولعنة الله الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله جرنا وجركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام. We will recap briefly from where we left off yesterday. Then we will show this trend of evolution of the Islamic law from within the Quran. And then finally we will talk about what are those factors that perturb us, that frighten us from taking on such an inquiry of seeing whether things can change. What are those fundamental factors? And finally, we will finish with this particular discussion as to what is the appeal in religion in any case. Why do religions appeal to people? So yesterday we stated that religion is the communication of God or a divine authority or from a superior realm to human beings in order to fully organize the lives of human beings and to orient them with their lofty purpose and to move them towards the attainment of the fullness of their purpose. In our case, the actualization of our humanity. In addition to the law system, religion in essence has theological teachings that talk about God, his connection to the world, that talk about accountability, the talk about a purpose. It also teaches us that we need to be virtuous from within. We need to acquire godlike qualities. We need to surrender to God. And this is where religions that advocate a God differ from those religions that may not advocate a God in the way that we understand God. Surrendering, this is achieved by surrendering to God through the agency of devotion and worship where we give ourselves over to Allah and Allah molds us in his beautiful image. He is the forgiver, be forgiving. He is merciful, be merciful. He is tolerant, appreciative, be like him. He is charitable, be charitable. He in himself is full of clemency. Acquire that within your soul. Become a complete, saintly, godly person within yourself. And I term this a spiritual virtue or spiritual morality. Then we come to an understanding of how should human beings ought to be? What ought they to do within the societal context? This is a place where we understand values. Finally, when we understand values, as we discussed yesterday, we come to the question of, well, how do we now apply them physically in the realms of human beings? And then that then translates as physical laws, the do's and don'ts. Do not cheat, fair trade, human rights. This is how those moral, beautiful values translate in day-to-day -day life and everyday life and our interactions. We stated here, what changes out of all of this? Theology does not change the nature of God is the nature of God. Human purpose cannot change. We want to become God-like. Accountability will always be there. 
virtues never we have to acquire a virtuous state moral values no we always seem to know how we ought to be with each other in terms of being fair and how to organize our life so the only thing that changes is how we apply these moral values in the form of law which then governs the human community and if Mahdi Salamullah is going to bring another religion then him bringing another religion can only mean that he will change the application of moral values in day-to-day -day life that is all he will do and that is not a strange phenomena religions previously have done that religions have abrogated previous religions Isa did not abrogate the religion of Moses in terms of denying God or human virtues he merely abrogated Moses' religion in the realm of application of those beautiful moral values. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, came and abrogated the Old Testament and the New Testament law. He did not abrogate the Abrahamic God. He did not abrogate virtues. He merely came and abrogated the way in which the moral values are translated and formulated into physical law. That's the only thing Al Mahdi can change. So the only area that Al Mahdi can effect with change is cutting off the hands. The rights of men and women, the rights of animals, the attitudes towards others. These are the only things he can come and change. And for that he might be then charged with changing the religion of his blessed and noble grandfather. Now we stated yesterday and we want to pursue this point fully more today with concrete understanding that it is a living reality. That a human community is not static, it's not stagnant. We've been talking about this from the very beginning that there is dynamism in the world of God in the cosmos. This dynamism affects every area of the physical universe that we are experiencing. There is nothing that is left untouched. Everything is on the move. Everything is moving. There is dynamism. This motion cannot be arrested. With this motion, there is another internal motion within our humanity. And that is that we are fully realizing ourselves. And one of the points of self-realization is the acquisition of what we call nobility. Think about this carefully. The species upon the face of this earth, are they evolving? We have seen an elephant, the same elephant, for the last 20, 30 years, haven't we? They are the same. But in the case of human beings, their features are the same. However, the way they think and their outlook, their understanding of the world has changed altogether. 30 years ago, they had a very different understanding of the cosmos. Today, they have a very different understanding of the cosmos. 30 years ago, they did not have the sophisticated theories that they have today. 30 years ago, there was a different social system how it's tweaked. Three decades ago, there was a very different understanding of economy. Now it's changed. We are constantly growing. Our inquisitive minds are learning. We are benefiting from trial and error. So unlike the elephant, the human being is evolving intellectually. There is motion, not only physical motion, but intellectual motion. But together with intellectual motion, there is something else within the human being, and you can't deny this. It's something grand about the human being that is there within the Quran. And it just shows how little we are aware of the content of the Quran. If you were to input data within the computer, the computer will gain more data, but nothing else will increase within the computer. Can you see that? Take the scenario of an artificially intelligent robot who is constantly learning, Lucy, she is constantly learning, yes? Is she a resident of South, uh, Saudi Arabia now or is she still in America? She, gets, she has dual nationality, by the way. 
never mind, never mind. You are not the right audience for this. Lucy is gaining knowledge all the time. But Lucy's sense of understanding of her own personal being in terms of morality, virtue, and nobility is still the same. Lucy, with the input of all the knowledge that she has, she is not moving substantively from within herself. There is no substantial motion from within herself. Now contrast that with a growing child. Contrast Lucy with a growing child. A child, as a toddler, will scream and shout in front of us here. And we take pleasure, don't we? But that same child, when they hit their teens, it will be below the expectation of that teenager to run around and shout here in this congregation. But they can still play on their phones while I'm lecturing. Nobody's doing that right now, alhamdulillah. But a grown person, it is below their prestigious state to play around with their phone while I'm talking, unless, of course, they're making notes on what I'm saying. Can you see that? Where is this change coming from? This is known as the realization of their nobility. There is something different going on within the human beings. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam." We have ennobled the son of, or the children of Adam. I dare say son, daughters as well. You guys are not going to get me today at all. And I'm going to stop all of this and I'm going to continue with the task at hand. Forget this. We have this thing known as nobility within us. So with the increase of knowledge, there is also a substantive growth within our beings. That is known as nobility. Human beings become noble with the progress of the species as they do so with the progress of the individual from childhood into adulthood. So now, when the moral system is applied in the context of children, it will formulate itself in one way. When the same values are formulated in the context of grown adults, they will be formulated differently. In the case of the children, the moral value is they must learn the textbook. What do we do? We incentivize them, don't we? I will give you this much if you study this. I will give you this much money if you pray. Namaz or Salah, we incentivize them. There are some who are not incentivized by offerings. So we punish them or we threaten them. When a grown adult is approached, we tell them the benefits of this learning and leave it at that. Their nobility is such that they do not need to be incentivized or threatened. Because this is a noble human being. And that is why we find this example within the books of fiqh. That when a noble man commits a crime, the judge does not need to punish that person if there is no prescribed punishment. The only thing the judge does is turns his face away. And that is the biggest slap on the face of the noble man. That you are not worthy of me looking at. Human nobility grows. And with the growth of human nobility, the way the moral values are then formulated changes. In all of this, we had one yardstick. And that was that there has to be fair play and justice. We stated that what is just at the level of a child is not just at the level of a teenager. And what is just at the level of a teenager is not just at the level of a grown adult. So therefore, we cannot understand what is justice. All we understand is what is injustice. And therefore, we are constantly tweaking the, 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 the situation in order to get it up to the state of justice all the time. We are constantly mending it. All we know is, in Allah laysa bi dhallamin dil abid. Allah can never be oppressive. But what is justice? We don't know. We have to figure it out. 
It's an evolving system. In an evolving system, you cannot have a yardstick. You can't. It's impossible. As soon as you say this is justice, it will change by tomorrow. We gave an example. It was fine to give women less pay than men a few years ago. Today's become unjust. This growth in the sense of justice and injustice has not occurred through our physical growth, nor our intellectual growth. It has only occurred through our sense of nobility becoming refined. The no sense of nobility has become refined, and therefore we say that this is now unjust. It's not based, based on knowledge base, because people who are not noble, they have all the knowledge in the world, they are still very oppressive and unjust people. We left it at that, that the situation is this, that human community can never stagnate. It is always on the move. There is certain dynamism inside it. Now we want to further emphasize this point by looking at the Quran. Muslims are naive, as are the Christians and the Jews and the Hindus. This is the human condition. It's a condition of naivety, simplicity of inability to understand. My talk here is not for the Muslims, it's for the people of the faith. This is the problem that we have. And people of no faith have the same problem when they latch on to ideas. They cannot let go. See, we feel in our minds that Islam is a full packaged religion and that it was delivered in one shot. Ah, there you go, this is Islam, your new way of life. Think about it, does that make sense? How can that make sense? Religion has a divine aspect that is communication from a loftier authority. But who is it a message to? To human beings. Are human beings divine or lofty or unchanging reality? No, they are changing reality. So the divine message is within the folds of humanity and therefore it becomes a human phenomena. Religion is a human phenomena. By human phenomena, what we mean is it, it's, it pertains to the same dynamism that humanity belongs to. It undergoes the same changes that humanity undergoes. Otherwise, it can't be applicable to human beings. So religion has a divine face, but it also has a human face in its application. And therefore, it is human phenomena and subject to the same dynamism and motion that humanity is subject to. You will ask me, how do you evidence it? The evidence is clearly in front of us in the Quran. But you will say, I read it from Baqarah to Nas, I don't find it. I said, of course you're not going to find it, are you? Because Baqarah to Nas has, is a religious book for us that we read in Ramadan, yes? and we get thawab from it, the whole attitude is incorrect of reading this book. Think about it carefully as to what I'm saying here. Molanas normally say, nahi samjha, kisi ne nahi samjhi meri baat. I'm saying I myself, I'm not understanding myself today. It's inspirational. Read the book, how? How it was revealed. The chronological order of revelation. The Quran that we have today is not the Quran revealed on the Prophet in terms of its sequence. Today we start from Hamd, Surah Baqarah. Surah Baqarah was the first surah to be revealed in Medina when Islam begins to acquire the status of a state, where it is beginning to interact with a broader community, where it wants to create an identity of its own small Muslim community. How can Surah Baqarah give us a true sense of what God has done through the prophetic mission? The Prophet starts off his missionary role in Makkah. Is there an Islamic state? No. Is he facing a pluralistic community to which he's addressing as a Muslim? No. He's just an individual. He doesn't even have any followers. Can you see that? Twenty Three years of revelation, 13 of them are in Makkah. Am I right there? And 10 are in Medina. So the bigger chunk of the Quran is revealed in Makkah. The lesser part of the Quran is revealed in Medina. Now if we revert to the Meccan Surah and start reading it from there, 
then our naivety and simplistic notions will be dispelled for once and for all. It's not the way we've understood. We see this beautiful dynamism within the Quran itself. That the essence is given, morality is given, virtues are given, and then they are formulated later on. And the formulations are changing. Phenomenal. And how did the Muslim mind allow itself to forget this? So go to the Meccan verses. The Quran talks about the being of God. One God. The Quran talks about salvation. The Quran talks about Qiyamah. The Quran talks about responsibility. The Quran talks about eventual end. The Quran talks about human virtues. Be godly, God-centric. Do not kill your children. Do not cheat. Do not do this. Do not do that. Quran talks about the beautiful moral values. It talks about the state of being God-connected and God-centric. It talks about care of the orphans. It talks about care of the poor. It talks about the care of the family. Then later on, it formulates how you take this care. How you connect with God. What is identity? What are the rights of others? It's phenomenal the way it starts. So in the Meccan verses, Allah talks about the Jews and the Christians in the context of Moses and Isa. And phenomenally he talks about them. Doesn't distinguish between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. Talks about Muslim in the broader sense. Talks about the virtues of those prophets talks about the challenges that those prophets faced, talks about Quran being in line and sync with the same message brought by Ibrahim, Musa and Isa, salamu alayhim, Ajmain and Nabi Nuh, and Ilyas, and all the rest of them. Then you come to Medina, and we're going to take a few examples to explain this. Then, he comes, then you come to Medina. What does the Quran talk about? He talks about relations with the Mus by, uh, between the Muslim community and the Christian community. This wasn't there in the Meccan verses. How do you formulate now your morals within a state context? He talks about the salvation of the people of the book in Medina, all of them. He talks about relations with the Jews and the Christians. It's not concerned about marry or don't marry them. Everything was allowed at that point. Then you get verses, do not befriend the Jews and the Christians. Then towards the end of the prophetic mission, it says today their food is halal on you and today you're allowed to marry their women again. Now if anybody were to look at this order, you will say, well, initially it was only giving the beautiful essence of the teachings of all of the Abrahamic faiths and the virtues and the moral values. Then we come to Medina. It gives them equal status, salvation, equal interaction between all the communities. Then there is a period in which we see strain between the Muslim community and the Jewish Christian community. Then it reverts to the formal state that now eat from each other. <coughs> Marry now their women. What happened? This is what is happening. The dynamism that is there within the Medinan society is causing fluctuations in how these values are then molded and brought out in the fashion of law. There was a strain when the Jewish and the Mus uh, Christian community went against the blessed prophet and the Muslim community. There was a strain. And therefore those verses came and dealt with it in their context. And finally the verses came and reverted the whole situation to the former situation. But look at the mind of the Muslim. The Muslim does not understand any of that. The Muslim will say that the Quran is saying, do not take Jews and Christians as friends. Can you see that? The Muslim has forgotten altogether that the Quran is saying they will get paradise, they will get salvation, that the Quran is establishing its own validity on the stories of Moses, Isa and Ibrahim. This is the whole failure of the Muslim community to read the Quran accurately. Look at the law of brotherhood in Islam and inheritance through brotherhood. When the Muslim community came to Medina, they left everything back in Makkah. The Prophet initiated brotherhood 
between people who had no blood relations or kinship. Uh, sorry, or no blood relations or family relations, familial relations. They arbitrarily became brothers through a bond that was created through the Sharia, that I make you my brother. And by that, they could inherit each other. When their families migrated to Medina and immigrated from Makkah, the whole law of brotherhood was cancelled. And mutual inheritance between unknown people was cancelled. Look at this fluctuation. Look at this change in the way the law is, the moral values are being applied. Prophet had an adopted son by the name of Zaid from his wife Khadija. Let me just rephrase that. Khadija was gifted a slave. She gave him to the Prophet. The Prophet told him, I mean, it's a long story, his father came to take him, so he said, you can go with your father if you want to stay with me. He said, I want to stay with you, O Muhammad. So he said, now I adopt him in align with the Arab traditions. Later on, Quran comes and abolishes taking of sons in this fashion. Look at this fluctuation. Look at this change. Then, look at the whole issue of so fasting. When the Prophet was told to fast, he upheld the Christian fast. Then the Quran came and modified it and made it a simpler fast. Then zakat. Zakat was voluntary giving in the way of God. You come to Medina, it becomes a state intervention that this is the percentage of zakat that you will give and these are the recipients who will receive the zakat. And then our ulama say that we have evolved far more than that situation. So the recipients of zakat are far more than those listed in Surah Toba. Look at salah, connected with God, being connected with God. Salah never meant this ruku and sujood in the initial verses. It just meant that God's centricity and connected to God. Then the ruku came, then the sujood came, then the timings came. It was all voluntary and then finally it became an identity issue for the Muslims and it got firmly formulated. Then you see the abrogated verses. They are coming and they are abrogated. Why? Because the application does not require it anymore and hence they are abrogated. So this dynamism that we are talking about is there within the revelatory period itself. Within the 23 years, we are seeing that dynamism, that what was just at one instance may not have been just as another instance, and therefore the Quran changed it and the Prophet changed it. Sometimes there was reversion, sometimes there was abrogation, abolishment, so on and so forth. It was a very natural process. The failure of the Muslim mind is that they have taken the Quran as one thing, and they do not distinguish between what surah is saying and another surah. What came first, what came second, what came third. The law system was always in a state of flux, evolving, evolving, evolving. So this is what I'm saying. That if it has evolved during the lifetime of the prophet, do you really think that the wheels of evolution and growth come to a stop after the demise of the prophet? Do you really naively feel that? I don't want to continue on this too much because it's the night of Hazrat Abbas and I want to get this talk somewhere. I want to ask a question on the back of this. What is the appeal of religion? Why are people appealed by religion? When the Prophet came to his community, he said, do not kill each other. They said, yeah, this sounds good. Don't bury your daughters. They said, yes, this makes sense. Don't cheat. Don't lie. Trust in Allah. Be truthful for your commitments. Be good to your parents. Do not shout at each other. Do not walk arrogantly upon the earth. Be mellow in your tone. Be caring. Care for each other. That was the huge appeal. Why? Because people saw that this is a humanitarian religion. It is a fair religion. It is a just religion. It's a productive religion. It empowers us, instills confidence with us, gives us Allah as that point to which we need to grow. And Allah liberates us. 
Whereas before we were stuck to the sands of Arabia, now we can take to the mighty oceans. And if we want in due course of time, then we will then penetrate into the heavens as the Quran says, Fanfudu, go, take flight. That was the appeal of religion because it was in sync with the human condition of wanting to liberate, of wanting to grow, of wanting to accomplish itself. Would you agree with that? that that is what appealed the people to the message of the Blessed Prophet. Would you agree with that? Now, the Muslims come today to the global human and they say, you can marry a two-year-old girl or a nine-year-old girl. You have to chop hands off a thief. That the woman does not have a right to divorce. You beat a woman, you can do whatever you want. Do not befriend the Jews and the Christians. They will not go to paradise. Do you really think these teachings would appeal to the global human being? They will say they are regressive. They are barbaric. Give money to an authority that has no accountability or its distribution is X, Y, and Z. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm just asking a question here. It is because of this that Mahdi will come and change religion, the application of those beautiful virtues and moral values. What has been the sticking point of the Muslim? is that they do not give themselves the right to critique or analyze the religious text. The Sahaba gave themselves the full God-given right to question the Prophet and say, Oh Muhammad, why do you say this? Explain yourself. Why does the Quran say this? We need to reason with it and understand it. But the Muslim today takes birth in a fully packaged faith that was packaged 1,400 years ago and does not give himself the right to critique because of the naive assumption that if I believe in God, that I have to believe in the truthfulness of whatever God says. God says the truth, no doubt, but have we understood what God is saying? I often ask my audience, had you not taken birth in Christianity, would you be Christians? Judaism, would you be Jewish? Jews, Islam, would you be Muslims? Hinduism, would you be Hindus? And the answer is when you revert into yourself, never, never. I would be appealed by the spiritual facets of it, the virtue, understanding of it, but never would I follow this religion as a code of life in the way in which it is. You know, you say to a person when you're doing wudu, if just a hair goes up, your wudu is valid. You fold your arms, their prayers are not accepted. People will say, for the sake of Allah, shouldn't Allah be happy that they are worshipping Him? Whether they fold their arms or they are opening their arms. What sort of a religion you bring to us? When Mahdi comes, he is going to be just happy that people pray. The Muslims pray Salah, the Christians pray to God, the Jews pray to God, he will be happy. He won't be concerned about where you put your arms. The second thing is, first thing is this uncritical nature of ours. The second thing is, the big failure is our fear of getting it wrong. And we want to develop this tomorrow. We are constantly frightened that we'll get it wrong. Tell me, what can you get wrong? What can you get wrong? Will you ever go and unjustly kill somebody, steal from somebody, deprive somebody of their rights, strip somebody of their dignity? Will you do such unjust, ungodly acts? No. So how can you get it wrong? Or what if their arms are supposed to be straight and then we fold them? I said, is that actually getting it wrong? Does that mean getting it wrong? Think about it. Our feeble minds, we are afraid we'll get it wrong. But I ask a simple question, how can you get it wrong? Will you say don't worship Allah? No. Will you say you have no accountability? No. Will you say stop being charitable? No. So how can you get it wrong? 
Or what if I open my fast before the sunset? That's not meaning of getting it wrong. Yes, I know some people will say that's wrong. I shouldn't have given that example. <laughs> but when you ask them, what is the meaning of getting it wrong? You'll be surprised. There is no understanding of, well, we can't get it wrong. In fact, we will show tomorrow that we are always in the wrong until we get it right. And we will never get it right until humanity comes to its utmost fruition and completion. And that is what causes dynamism. We come to the mention of the greatest hero that we have seen, the one who inspires us to no end, the likes of whom the human history seldom witnesses, fills our hearts with awe. As we tremble in his oar, we fall helplessly in love with him and melt away in him. What a man, Abbas ibn Ali. We have been nurtured in his love from the cradle. But if anybody did not know him and heard his story, they would fall in love with him as much as we are in love with him. We live by him. We die by him. He is the very substance that flows within our veins, the very name upon our lips, the defiance in our heart, the lion heart. In his description, the Imam says, Kana kal Jabal al Adim, Abbas, was like a lofty mountain. And his heart was like a momentous wave. Because he was Faris and Hammam, he was a champion swordsman and a defiant warrior. Fearlessly would he advance amidst the striking blades and the showering arrows and tear apart the ranks of the enemies. One of the later Imams says, it was a sixth Imam, he says, my uncle Abbas has such a rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Qiyamah that one and all will become envious of him. They will say, whose light is that that shines so brilliantly? It will be said, this is the light of the son of Ali the brother of Hussein al-Abbas, Abbas. Imam says, Abbas, nafiz, nafid al-basira, sulbul iman. Abbas had penetrative insight and was staunch in faith. In one of the hadith he says, that indeed Allah gives him wings in place of the arms that he gave for his brother. Like he gave wings to Ja'far Tayyar to take flight within the spiritual realm and be wherever he wants to be. This Abbas, the way he gives himself, is an example in itself. I'm going to narrate this incident. That a builder was called to mend the grave of Abbas as it had become waterlogged. He said, when I looked at the grave, I looked at its size, and I said to Sayyid Baharul Ulum, I said, my master, is it true what you say about Abbas? That as he saddled his steed, his feet almost reached the ground. He said, indeed, Abbas was of that stature. He said, then why is his grave so small? The Sayyid struck his head against the grave of Abbas and he lamented, فَقَطَّعُوهُ irban irba." Abbas was hacked to pieces. He did not fall. His decapitated body left the steed. Abbas has many names. The most prominent are Qamar Bani Hashim, Hamil al-Liwa and Sakka. 
the luminous moon of the Hashemis. In the Battle of Sifin, when Imam Ali would enter within the battlefield and call upon his equal, no one would dare approach Imam Ali. Because effortlessly the Imam would put them to death. So Imam would wear a face mask and then enter into the battlefield. And then his opponents would come. And then when they would see the way he moves his sword, they would realize it is Ali. Imam sent Abbas, who was at the age of 13, with his face covered in a mask. Abbas calls on. They send a hero. Effortlessly, Abbas puts him to that. There is commotion within the Syrian army. This is Ali deceiving you again. Do not approach him. As there is this talk and commotion, Imam Ali rides from behind. He comes next to Abbas. He puts his hand on the face mask of Abbas. And as he begins to unveil him, he says, Ana Ali ibn Abi Talib, wa Qamar bani Hashim. I am Ali, the son of Abu Talib. And this is the moon of the Hashimis, Abbas. This is how gallant Abbas was. This is the champion that Abbas was. We read in some of the books, and I see no harm in narrating this, that Abbas was chosen for his strength and his defiance through choosing his mother. It is said when Abbas took birth, Ali began to weep and kiss his arms. They say, Ali, why do you weep? He said, by Allah, he will have them cut for his Hussein. They say when the spoils of war were being brought into the court of Yazid alongside the captives, he saw a standard. He said, whose standard is this? It is struck in every place, but the hand that held it, but in the place where the hand held it, they said it is the standard of Abbas. He did not let it go until his hand was severed from his body. Yes, it said, Abbas, I salute you and your bravery. Abbas is of this stature. On the morning of Ashura, Abbas is keeping guard of the tents in order to prevent the enemy from mounting an attack and ambush from the rear side of the tents. Zuhair ibn Qayyim comes to Abbas. He says, oh Abbas, do you know why your father had sought you? He said, Zuhair, it is a very sensitive moment, but you have mentioned the name of my father, and I cannot but pay heed to you. Tell me what you want to tell me, Zuhair. He said, your father asked for you for such a day. Abbas, in a rage, places his feet within the stirrups of the horse. The horse kneels. He says, Zuhair, do you incite me? What is your intention? Then in a rage, when he hears somebody swearing at Al Hussein, he says, Oh Hussein, because Imam Hussein had dug a trench and filled it with firewood and set it alight. He said, Oh Hussein, do you wish to fall into the fire before God casts you into the fire? When he heard this in a rage, he subdued that person. There were 80 people that were blocking him, he removed them all. And with one spear blow, he beheads that person. Then he comes back to Zuhair. He says, Zuhair, away with you. Do not come between me and my task on this day. This is Abbas, Hussein Abbas. Abbas, who is the brother of Zaynab. And Abbas, 
who is the pillar of strength of his Hussein. Abbas fights as the commander of the army. With Hussein, he attends to everyone who has fallen until all have died. None remains. Abbas stands in front of Hussein. And he says, oh Hussein, your loneliness is unbearable. Allow me to fight. Allow me to defend you. Hussein says, ya Abbas. Benafsi anta, ya Abbas. May my life be sacrificed for you, oh Abbas. Ida madaita. If you go, Abbas, the morale of my army will break. Oh, brother, what army remains? It is but you and I. Hussein looks at Abbas, and there is a cry from within the tents. Abbas, take heed. A child may have lost his life. Abbas goes. He sees little thirsty children rubbing the skins of the water skin upon their bellies so that the moist leather may quench some of their thirst. He takes the water skin for children. I shall bring back some water for you. Abbas comes out. Says Hussein, allow me to bring some water back for them for they die of thirst. Hussein knows this is the final farewell. Longingly, Hussein looks into the eyes of Abbas. Abbas kisses the forehead of Hussein, ascends his steed, looks towards the heavens. O oh Allah, allow me to fulfill this promise. Abbas goes. Hussein begins to follow him. Abbas looks at Hussein. Retreat, oh brother, retreat. Hussein does not. The enemy is mounting attack. Hussein gets wounded. And Abbas goes on to his way towards Al Qama. There is a guard upon Al Qama. Abbas removes them. Nobody is able to face this warrior. He enters within the river, commands his steed to drink water. The horse refuses. He cups the water and raises it in order to entice the steed to drink. But as he raises the water, he looks at the water. And he says, Ya Nafs, bin Ba'd al Hussein Ahuni, O soul, surrender to death. It does not befit you to live after Hussein. Had al Hussein, Warid al Banuni, O soul, do you not see how Hussein is surrounded by death? Shall you drink of the cold water? Then he throws the water and he says, well, By Allah, Abbas shall not do such a thing. He fills the water, comes out of the al fights the enemy. They know the only way to prevent Abbas is to sever his arms. Abbas is fighting. Someone hides behind a tree. As Abbas passes him, he strikes upon the right arm of Abbas. Abbas's right arm falls. Abbas cries out, Wallah, law qata'atum yamini. By Allah, even if you cut my right arm, 
Abbas shall not stop defending his brother. Abbas fights with his left arm. Another one attacks Abbas and cuts his left arm. Abbas places the water skin in his mouth and grabs it with his teeth and directs his steed towards the tent. An eye in maze strikes the blessed head of Abbas. An arrow penetrates within the water skin and another within his, within his blessed eye. Abbas stops, lowers his head upon the neck of the horse. It is said that they surrounded him and they cut him. There was cries of jubilation. Shimmer said, what has happened? Abbas has fallen. He smiled. Now Hussein has no means but to surrender. As the standard of Abbas drops from afar, Hussein grabs hold of his waist. Unable to stand, he sits at the place where he stands. الآن انكسر ظهري وقلت حيلتي Now my back has broken and now I have no means of escape. Zuljana, take me to my brother. Zuljana goes and stops at a place. Zuljana, have you found my brother? Hussein descends. And he says, O oh, Zuljana, I do not see my Abbas. And there he finds the arm of Abbas. And he says, Wa Abbas. He finds Abbas. He sits next to him, unable to speak, choking. He lifts the head of Abbas and puts it into his lap. Abbas moves his head away. Abbas is saying something. Hussein begins to listen. Abbas says, O oh man, allow my brother to come to me before you sever my head. He says, O oh Abbas, it is I, your brother, I have come to you. He says, O oh brother, forgive me. I do not see you. There is an arrow in one eye and wound in another. Hussein clasps the head of Abbas to his chest and cries out aloud. The enemies begin to cry at the scene. And Hussein says, now you shed tears after you have taken my Abbas away from me. Hussein cries at that point then. Hussein tries to lift Abbas. Abbas says, oh brother, what is it that you try to do? Abbas, I must take you back to your sister. He said, oh Hussein, let me be. If she sees me, her morale will break. And I promised you, little Sakina, that I will bring back water. Spare me the embarrassment. Oh, brother, go and let me be. Abbas breathes his last. Hussein takes the standard of Abbas, defeated. He goes back towards the tent. We find in the description that Sakina says to the children, my uncle has come back. Sakina runs towards Imam Hussein. And behind her is Zainab. Sakina looks at Hussein. And she says, oh father, do you have any news of my uncle Abbas? Oh child, he lies slain at the banks of the Euphrates. Zainab says, oh Hussein, why did you not bring my brother back to me? Oh Zainab, even at his dying breath, he could not let go of you. Zainab slaps her face and says, Wa Gayata, Wa Killata Nasira, Wa Abbasa. 
ألا لعنة للقوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا ويمنقلم ينقلبون ما تم حسين حسين